Dr. Arlene O'Neill. I um, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but I did not do my degree here at Trinity. I did applied physics over in DCU. So at the time, it was just because of accommodation, I, I went over there. And um, I did a four year straight physics degree. And then I decided, you know what, I still want more. My appetite was only wetted, so I came to Trinity and I did a four year PhD in a field that I'm going to share with you today. So it's nanoscience. So I then. And became a postdoctoral research fellow where I am now. So let's get straight into it. Well, look, I'm going to be honest, I'm going to put it straight out there. I love physics. And, you know, some people can't handle that statement, but I really, really love it. I didn't always love it, mind you, and it was only because I moved school during June for a year that I was forced to take it up. And very begrudgingly, I took it up and I, and I decided, do you know what, I'm going to get stuck in, and I kept it up for the detail. So I did physics for the research. I didn't get an A, mind you, but I, I did okay on the subjects, but it was definitely my favorite. So I, physics to me is the world around us. And what I like to do is, you read it in a book, but it comes alive when you look around. And even within this room, I can see physics everywhere. So that's, that's what I think keeps my passion going. So whether I'm on the bus, whether I'm on the plane, whether I'm on the train, wherever, anywhere, I bring physics to it. So there are some main categories that the Institute of Physics of Ireland has broken physics into, I think it's about 12, and these are optics and photonics, biophysics, superconductivity, material physics, electricity and magnetism, nuclear particle and high energy physics, chemical physics, thermodynamics, astronomy and physics, mechanics, semiconductor physics, and finally, nanoscience. So they are main kind of branches of physics, but when you become an undergrad in a physics you cover them all, generally. Some focus on different areas more. For example, MPCAM, which is probably what you're most of you are interested in, and I'll talk about later, you do more nanoscience. But that's just something to bear in mind. So as a physicist, during a degree, and if you did a straight physics degree, or you do science and you specialize in physics, you get to know a lot, a little about it a lot. So it gives you an opportunity then to see a lot, and then choose what you do like. So I found during my degree, nanoscience and nanotechnology was the most fascinating. So I'm here this morning to share that with you and teach you a little bit about nanoscience. So I do a lot of school trips and um, I like to introduce them to this very famous physicist, Professor Richard Feynman. Has anybody ever heard of him? Yeah, yeah great. Well, that's fantastic. Um, and he gave a very, very famous lecture in 1959 on the 29th of December. Right, so a couple of days after the piece, so quite soon. Um, entitled There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. So he was the first person to spark the interest that if you're going to make the trees bigger the whole time, why not make them smaller? Why not go down to the molecules and atoms and see how things behave? And um, this really excited the scientific community. Some people probably in the audience would have thought he was perhaps still drunk from Christmas because it was very abstract what he was proposing. And he put out two challenges. Um, <coughs> One was to make a rotor, and one was to write an entire encyclopedia on the tip of a pin. So people thought, wow, okay, well, we're going to have to come up with a whole new technology to be able to do that. So he offered a thousand um, dollars at the time, which was a hell of a lot of money in 1959, um, to, for someone to, for, to put that out to somebody to try and realize it, and they did. So that was achieved, and an entire encyclopedia was on, wrote on the tip of this sparked a whole new world that we can get into. So if you don't mind, I'm going to take you on a journey into that world to give you a real kind of appreciation of how small an animal is. So typically, in your garden, a rose bush is about one meter wide. If we zoom in on a leaf, we're about 10 centimeters. If we go in on a fly on the leaf in the bush, we're about one centimeter. If we go down into the eye of the fly, we're at about 100 microns. So that's typically about the strand, the width of a strand of brunette a blob of hair is actually a blob of thinner. So about 100 microns. And at this resolution, the eye is starting to actually, it, it's not resolving uh, things as easily as it would like. So we have to use a whole new type of microscopy called electron microscopy. So you know that the image went from visible to something in color, then to a black and white image. And that's because we're using, we're no longer using light, because light can't even see things at this scale. So small that light waves don't interact with it. So we have to use something with a smaller wavelength, and that's electrons. 
So it's a whole new field of microscopy, electron microscopy, that allows you to look into this world. So we're still going deeper into this, uh, into this fly. We're at about 10 microns. If we go down to the structure, a tiny little structure on the fly, fly's eye, we're about a micron. If we go down to the base of that structure, we're at about 100 nanometers. So the nano world is considered something between um, one right up to 100 nanometers. And if we go down into the DNA of the fly on the leaf on the bush, we're finally at about 10 nanometers. And then if we go into a couple of atoms wide inside the DNA, we're finally at the nanometers. So it's an it, 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 to me, it's an incredible quantity to try and realize how the hell do we get down there. And, and it's such a journey that perhaps, um, you know, is it really a possibility to get down there? And in fact, I do it every day. We have loads of different, very, very high-tech microscopes and S STM, scanning tunnel microscopes, atomic force microscopes, a whole wealth of uh, technologies to get into this tiny, tiny world. So that's, that's very achievable when we go down to that scale every day. So now you have an appreciation of how small we go in the nano world. You may have heard of different nano words. So there's a lot of kind of buzz out there about nano. So nano is the prefix that tells you it's small. So whatever the second word that comes next, so in this case, nanobots, nanoscience, nanostuff, nanotechnology, it's small technology, small science, small bots, small medicine, whatever the case is. And at this point, um, and this is one thing that I loved about my degree course, was that during the leaving search, it was very fundamental physics. The, the classical mechanical world, Isaac Newton and gravity and forces, but when you get into college, you start working on things called and you may have heard it from the Big Bang Theory. They, they throw those words around loosely. But in fact, quantum mechanics is a whole set of laws that govern <coughs> how atoms behave right down to the, at the atomic and the nano scale. So things behave very differently when we get down there because there's a whole new set of physical rules that we obey. And in fact, they behave far superior than anything we could ever imagine in our world. So it's very exciting um, to work at this scale. So I told you that anything below a nano, 100 nanometers is a nano, considered part of the nano world, but there are certain materials that once one of their dimensions, whether it's their three-dimensional, two-dimensional, one-dimensional, or zero-dimensional, one or one, for example, uh, one of their dimensions is on the order of a nanometer. So in this case, all of the, its length, its width, and its breadth are all on the nanometer scale. So this is a zero-dimensional material. In this case, it's a um, width and height are both on the nanometer scale, so electrons must only travel in one direction, hence the one-dimensional material. In two-dimensional, we have the height component is actually reduced down to the nanometer scale, and we have two-dimensional material, and then three-dimensional, you could have structures that are, for example, 100 nanometers or 120 nanometers, and they're kind of still part of the nanomaterial family. So there's a whole range of materials. <coughs> now, I told you that Ricky Twine started this, pioneered this field in 1959. Well, actually, it took until 1985, the year I was born, before one actual nanomaterial was found. And it was found in, um, over in Rice University, over in Houston, by um, Harry Croto and Richard Smalley. And basically, it was 60 carbon atoms. But it was the first time that they found a structure that was completely on its own nanoscale. Every, all, its, all of its dimensions were on, on the order of nanometers, but also that it was thermodynamically stable. It could exist on its own. It didn't, for example, air didn't crush it, or it didn't disintegrate. It was its own entity. So it's considered a zero-dimensional material. And the scientific world was extremely excited when they discovered this, because it opened the prospect for perhaps with other structures and other nanometers. But it wasn't until 1991, until they were actually trying to make those buckyballs, those ser um, spherical structures of carbon, that they found another form of carbon uh, in a cylinder form, and that's the carbon nanotube. And this was by Ijima and, um, in China. And basically, we thought the scientific world got excited about the buckyball, but things really got heated up when they found this one. Because this material is incredibly strong, has a very high aspect ratio, and there is an absolute huge amount of applications that we can put carbon nanotubes in. So everybody started to shift their research onto nanomaterials, and specifically this one. But the 
then the newest member of the carbon material family is graphene. So we've all heard of graphite, which is the crystal in the center of your pencil. So when you write, you actually leave behind sheets of graphene and other materials. But this is the two-dimensional <coughs> form of carbon. And it's one single sheet of carbon atom six. And we thought people got excited about the nanotube. Well, in fact, people got <coughs> immensely excited about graphene. And it was only discovered over in Manchester um, by two Russian scientists, Andrei Gein and Konstantin Novoselov. And wow, the world, wor the, the scientific world re really shook when they found this one. So what it looks like is, actually this is an atomic resolution image that was taken here in Trinity. We would zoom in and we look in at the atoms on the surface of the carbon and we can actually resolve them. So we do have this sort of capability. But graphene, um, unlike the other use of nanomaterials, is far superior. It's the strong, it's even stronger than carbon nanotubes. In fact, it's 200 times stronger than steel. It's um, stretchy. It is a very high thermal conductor, so it actually is a, holds the record. It, um, strong, it's strong, it's ballistic conduction. So by that I mean electrons can travel through without being scattered, so it conducts electricity faster than anything <coughs> ever discovered before. So people really started to work on this. And as such, the two people that discovered won the Nobel Prize in 2010 in physics. So that's quite a, sh a short wait they had from 2004 to 2010 for that Nobel Prize. But it just kind of really um, emphasizes the importance that graphene is going to make um, in the future, provided we have more nanoscience scientists working on that space. So I've showed you how small a nanometer is, I've showed you what nanometers <laughs> look like, but we gotta take a step back and say, well, why bother? Why is small good? I made reference that the physics changes, and I keep trying to hammer that point home that everything is far superior than anything we could have in our world, and it's because of nanostructures and because of the surface of nanostructures that we have these increased properties. So let me just show you something. So if we take a cube and half it, the surface area goes from, from about six meters squared, it's a meter, um, meter by meter by meter square uh, cube, we get a, a surface area about three meters squared. If we actually half that cube, we increase, we double the surface area to 12 meters squared. So just by chopping something up, we're creating more surfaces. If we do it again, divide it into three, we increase the surface area up to 18 meters squared. What if we were to break this up into nanometer sections? We have a hell of a lot more surfaces. And physics, the chemistry, the biology all happen due to the surfaces. So if we are creating more surfaces, we're creating a lot more processes a lot faster. So that's one huge attribute why nanomaterials are behaving far superior. Um, I told you as well that graphene is super strong, but this is a nice little image. But if we had a sheet of graphene as thick as a piece of plate foam, and it would take an elephant standing on a pencil to break through it. So, you know, force, uh, pressure is force per unit area, so that's a hell of a lot of force it would require. So let's think about using these nanomaterials in some of our applications. So they're great. I've shown you what they look like. I, I told you that it's well worth our while going down to the nanomaterial. But let's see how they're going to impact our lives. So if we take, for example, even space travel, it used to cost about $10,000 to put one kilogram into space. And you can imagine how many kilograms are in one of those shuttles. And if they have a satellite attached, or if they have anything, it, it's a huge <coughs> amount. So there's a lot of expense associated with space travel. But what if we were to make our rockets by putting nanomaterials into the current materials that make up our rockets, we would need less of our current materials because nanomaterials are far stronger and they allow the rocket to be a lot lighter. So it would cost a lot less fuel to put stuff up in space. Air travel, so we know, for example, say for example, this is the, 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 nano, the nano plane, the nano material plane. Um, if you fly to San Francisco, you need to stop either, either in London or you stop on the, the, west, the east coast of America. And that's due to fuel as well as many other reasons. But if we make your planes much lighter and stronger, they can hold fuel and, and use, a, use less of it as they travel. So there's a huge element of um, making our aircraft stronger to protect us, but also reduce uh, the fuel use. 
I would say all of our top athletes in every sport field are currently using now the sport strikes, golf clubs, tennis rackets, whatever the, whatever the sporting equipment is. Perhaps even Wayne Rooney has nano materials in his football boots mm -hmm. to allow him to kick that ball harder and um, I don't know, it, it, it would reduce muscle fatigue as well because they're going to be so, so light. So we recently bought, um, over in Cannes, we bought a graphene racket. So a racket that had graphene in it. And when I say you have normal racket and the graphene racket, there is a, a huge, significant amount of difference. So for athletes, they want to um, improve their performance for as long as they can so that they don't get muscle fatigue, but also that you know they hit the ball as hard as they can. And that of materials, in current materials, improves the property. So that's where one, um, application of nanomaterials can go in. Nanocomposites. And composites just means um, by mixing nanostructures in with current materials. Another industry that I, I suppose hasn't really exploded yet, but it's soon to come, is our clothing industry. By putting nanomaterials into the fibres that make up our clothing, we can change the properties of our clothing. We can make our, our clothing conductive. So some of you may have seen um, Nicole Scherzinger at an event she had a live Twitter feed coming across her dress. So this is one thing. I'm sure she had a battery pack and some sort of a, a Bluetooth connector and uh, various other components that weren't visible, that didn't make her very comfortable. But it was cool and it was novel. But what about if the nanomaterials are, per are put into the fibers that you don't see them, but they're there. They um, allow capabilities like that to happen without you even having to carry any extra components. So that's just one space, so electric clothing. Perhaps you don't like the color of your top, okay, that's the one thing that changes color. It's, the po possibilities are endless. So, um, or what about if you had your iPhone in your pocket <laughs> and there was some sort of a solar cell in the clothing, in the fibers in the clothing, and it was automatically charging your iPhone because you were collecting energy from, from the sun. So the prospects are there and they're not, th this is not science fiction, this is science fact and this stuff is, is happening. So self-cleaning clothes, for all the, the parents out there, probably the young people that don't do this, but wash, imagine you never have to wash your clothes. Well, there's socks currently out there on the market where they, they have silver nanoparticles in them and they're antibacterial as well, which they never need to see. So there's probably ethical issues around that as well, but we won't get into that today. But heat conductive, what about we're in a, a cold, cold room and suddenly our body temperature drops well, the fibers in your clothing start to froze and keep us warm. Or what about if we're out on a hot, hot day and the fibers loosen and allow more air in? So it's about clothes becoming more smart and uh, heat clothing is, is the future, electronic clothing. So heat conduction, moisture absorbing, <coughs> antibacterial, durable. Um, it, it's so much the potential applications by putting nanostructures into the fibers that make up our clothing. So I just wanted to show you this as well because this is important. Um, this is something that Professor Jonathan Coleman, who's a researcher here, has been working on. Um, by putting nanomaterials, and he puts them into um, latex, which is a different type of polymer, so it's like a rubber, like latex gloves. What about if he was to have a strain sensor in either clothing or some sort of um, fabric and <coughs> wear that as we sleep? So some people suffer from a thing called sleep apnea, where they stop breathing. So what if this clothing, this piece of clothing, it felt your lungs were not expanding and suddenly it set up an alarm to alert whoever's beside you or alert you to wake you up. So there are huge amounts of applications, especially in the health space, where by putting, having our clothing much more clever and smarter, as opposed to going to the doctor, it can email <coughs> to the hospital, your heart rate has dropped without you even being aware of it. Okay, then. So, and then of course our first line, the, the idea that have the capabilities of a full computer in your, your jacket. And there's no extra weight. Okay? So, what is this? Anybody get an idea? Computer. Yeah. It's one of the first computers. And it took a couple of people to man. It took up the space of a whole room. And all it could do was add, subtract, subtract, and multiply. It couldn't divide. So, um, so hey, we've come a long way. But we can see that, na that our components, our computers have changed. Well, what is the next generation of computers? And electronics, I suppose, generally, because by putting nanomaterials into, for example, plastic, what we hope is that we're going to be able to roll up your television, put it in your pocket, and take it back out. 
can roll up your laptop, put in your bottle of tape like it. So the next generation of electronics will be flexible. And now this old news, we worked on this technology a couple of years ago. This hasn't built through much. So nano and health. So this is a really hot space, and there's a lot of people around the world researching this. Um, can I have time? So for example, at, a, at the location of a tumor, blood flows quicker. But if you were to have um, some sort of an injection or drink a liquid of gold nanoparticle and it's still trial is ongoing, so this is not by any means fully understood, but if the gold nanoparticles get inside the tumor like you can see here, and they're exposed to some um, IO radiation or um, infrared, basically just heat, heat, they will they will start to vibrate and they will actually destroy that tumor. And then they will easily be excreted by the body. So there's a huge amount of and it's very spatially localized, so there's no damage to anything else going around or anything else in, in the vicinity. So there's huge, huge applications there as you as you can all tell. And um, in diagnostics, so this is an MRI, but using nanomaterials like drinking a liquid of nanomaterials, for example, um, your, your image that's produced in the, magnet in the MRI scanner is much more, um, there's much more information you can get out of it. There's much more, uh, I suppose, much more accuracy associated with your image. You can get much better results by, by taking nanomaterials. In arteries, you can push, so you know, if you have a heart attack and your arteries are clogged up with either nano stents, so if you put them in your arteries, they will keep the blood flow, keep it moving, start to be going. Drug delivery, well, there's a load of applications here, by specifically bringing specific um, nanomaterials to a specific location, activating them and <coughs> taking them away. And then lab on a chip. So I've recently gone to the doctor and got a blood test, and he took quite a bit of blood, and he tested for various many things. But really, I wanted to know there and then, was I okay? But the, the future of GPs will use these things called lab on a chip. So there are nanostructures on a chip, and they'll take tiny little specks of blood, it won't be those little bottles that they, they take three or four of them, um, and they'll <coughs> drop this on, and it will go into a load of different areas, testing for loads of different things. So this chip is tiny, and it will be readily available in all GPs. So it's all it's like testing for loads of different things all localized on one little chip. So nano and energy, so solar cells. I have solar panels on my house. They don't look as neat as these ones. They're, they're, it's like a big square panel or some are like two. But for the future of nano, but for the future of energy storage by using nanomaterials into putting them into plastics and things like that, they will mold onto the roof and you won't even see them there because they're going to collect all this and they'll do it really efficiently, and they'll store it for long periods of time. So the electric vehicle, again, like the aircraft, by making the vehicle lighter, the, it won't need as much energy, um, so it'll, it'll run for longer. Firstly, so the frame of the car will be lighter, but also in terms of you, you had nanostructures on the roof of this car, it would collect sunlight and charge as you drive. So, th so th that's a huge space. I have an iPhone, and I need to charge it every single day, sometimes because I forget to do it quite a bit. But what about if we have batteries that last in a month? We need to charge our iPhone once a month. The prospect of that is very, very encouraging to me. But energy storage, nanomaterials have capabilities to store energy much more efficiently. And then wind turbines, we can make them larger um, because they're going to be stronger by putting nanocomposites into them, but also that they will the, the transfer of the energy can be collected more efficiently. So, plenty of prospects. So, where do we do all this? Well, we're very lucky here at Trinity, and this is why I did my PhD here, um, because we have a center of excellence. And we're actually sixth in the whole entire world for nanoscience. So we're really a world contender in this space. We're putting out huge amounts of publications and top quality publications all the time. So this is the facility, you may have seen it, the dark line is just behind it. Um, it's called the Cran Institute. Science galleries on the ground floor. Well, I work, this is my lab here. This is one of my offices. And we have in this building physicists, chemists, biologists, because nanoscience is never just going to be that one discipline. It's a multidisciplinary subject that requires expertise from different areas. So it's a fabulous building.
then I strongly recommend you go visit it. And then for you guys, well, what, what subjects or what degrees <coughs> could you actually do to enable you to, to hopefully work there one day and be part of this nano revolution? Well, you may be familiar with NPCAM, so Nanoscience, Physics and Chemistry Advanced Materials. So I might just highlight that CRAN is the research institute, but you would be affiliated with the School of Physics. <coughs> so you would do your research there, but you, you, you will visit CRAN as well. So this, as you can see, the points are quite high, 570 um, in, in 2013. So it's become extremely popular. It's gone up 50 points in just one year. So that's, that's a, it's a fabulous degree. If I could go back, I would definitely partake in this one. And um, the code is 072 or 072. Then, of course, we've got common interest science, which will expose you to some nanoscience, but you can specialize them. And you can definitely speak to the physics fans here. They will know an awful lot more about the specifics of each of these courses. Of course, TP, theoretical physics, um, fabulous course. And I've done a lot of research with a lot of TPs. And, and, and the way you approach, if you become a TP, the way you approach things is different to someone who's come from an experimental or an applied background. So that's a fantastic course, and I strongly recommend it. Again, the points there are 490 and 490 for, for, for science. <coughs> so I suppose um, I just leave you with some social media things. But if you have any questions, I'll take them there. You're all going to be nano